this dog. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, Y'all excuse me, I'm over here adjusting myself and everything. I'm sitting at the park by the water. And uh, yeah, happy Thanksgiving, David. Amen. Happy holidays to all of you. Um, hopefully each and every one of you are happy and thankful <laughs> every single day of your life amen so good to see you all dialing in right now and thank you for taking out a few moments of your time um to share with me listen i know i've been on um a lot recently but what i'm doing is doing these little short snippets if you wills to kind of catch up with some of the questions that were asked on the other day monday night monday night for those of you who weren't there i i posted a comment about to um, answer the things that weigh heavy on your heart at times. Why? Because ultimately I wanted to take the opportunity to seek the Lord um, and to find answers in his word. Answers of which that many of us know. You already know already the answer to it, but maybe you just need that confirming word, that word to really fortify your spirit and to, to show you the right direction that you want to take. And so our next question, we talked about, first of all, we went over um, on Tuesday, I believe it was Tuesday, we went over on how to overcome worry. Um, and then on Wednesday, we talked about, um, we talked about those who have, um, um, <laughs> hold on, I'm just reading something here. Yeah. And so we, we talked about on, on Wednesday, we talked about dealing with the, the, the exhaustion that comes and finding balance in uh, ministry. You know, earlier today, we talked about, you know, how to find balance between, you know, your secular things and the spiritual things, you know, how to find balance even in ministry. So we talked about that. But now we want to talk about salvation to your household. Um, or salvation to my house, right? Um, now, uh, there, there are several things we need to understand. Firstly, let's remember the scripture. When, when Paul and them was in prison, when Peter and them was in prison, and, and the guard came and, and spoke to Peter, and Peter said, salvation has come to your house, right? And then there's another scripture where it says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you and your household will be saved right? This is, this is very important. And, and for those of us who are study, uh, students of the word, when you read these things, you know, you can find yourself thinking, well, Lord, my God, what, what's, what's up with me and my house? You know, because maybe not everybody in your house is saved. Um, but there's something key that we need to understand. And I want to share it with you this evening. And, and what I want to do is I want to share with you firstly, right? Let's, let's look at that particular scripture. Um, he says that if you believe on the Lord Jesus, then salvation will come to your house. What does it mean, that phrase, your house? That phrase, your house, means the, the place where you are the head. This is key. This is key. Um, even uh, Joshua said, he says, if you want to serve the gods on the other side, right? The gods of the other lands or the other people. He says, go right ahead. He says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay. So the, the first thing you have to, when you look at salvation to my house, you have to answer this question. Whose house is it? What do I mean by that? Who's running your house? Who's ruling your house? Who's running and who's ruling your house? Now, firstly, and, and this is going to touch on a lot of different subjects, because when you look at in the, the church circles today and Christendom today, there's a lot of believers who are walking in opposition of what Jesus said. For example, um, the word of God says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Um, cause it said, what fellowship has light with darkness? The scripture talks about two cannot, how can two walk together unless they agree? 
And there's a lot of believers who, because you were so anxious and desiring to get married, you got married to someone who you were not absolutely sure was saved. And that now you are a woman or man and you're going to church, but your spouse is at home. You're praying, right? God bless you, Bishop. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well. Um, you, you're praying, but they're not praying. <clears throat> you say something as simple as saying your grace. You said your grace, but they just started chowing down, right? You pray in the morning, maybe looking at your word or going on to the prayer line, but they're snoring in the bed next to you. Um, who's ruling your house and who's running your house? Because when you talk about salvation coming to your household, the Lord says that if you believe, then salvation has come to you and your household, you and your household. So that means if you are a spouse and your spouse is ruling the house, if you are a husband or a wife and your spouse is ruling the house and you're saved, you're going to have a greater difficulty with bringing salvation into your household. If you're saved, but you allow the kids to do whatever they want to do because you're trying to be their friend or because you don't want to disappoint them or because you don't want to see them cry, then yes, your children are ruling the house. This is, this is a very key point when it comes to salvation coming to my household. If I want salvation into my household, then I first have to be the ruler of that house. And then if I am submitting myself to God, then guess what? That means my whole house has to also submit to God, right? I was, I was talking to one friend of mine and he was talking about that. Uh, sometimes he'll get up in the morning and he'll tell his children, he's like, okay, come on, let's pray before you guys go to school. And the kids will be fussing and complaining because his kids as of yet are not saved. Right. But because he's the head of his household. Right. He actually makes them pray. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, it says train up a child. That word to train up means to discipline. It means to it means to correct when correction is necessary. It means to rebuke when rebuke is necessary. It means to chastise when chastisement is necessary. It says, train up your child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he won't depart from it. So that means while you're training, you're going to have this child exhibiting traits and attributes of rebellion, attributes of rebellion that will say, I don't want to do this. Why? I remember when I was a young kid, my mother was actually the ruling force in the house. She was a true matriarch, even though my dad was in the home. But my dad was more submissive. My dad was more, you know, laid in the cut. He was just, as long as she's happy, you know, the house is happy. Now, let me touch on something. And I know y'all gonna get mad at this. Y'all gonna get mad at this. I know y'all gonna get mad at this. In Christendom, in, in the Christian circles, right, we have a lot of y'all that's running around telling people a happy wife, a happy life. That is not biblical. And I'm going to pause for effect. That is not biblical. That is not of God. Because what would you say to somebody like David who was married to Michael? And if he was to make her happy, what would that mean? That means he would have to stop his worship. What would you say to somebody like Job, who wife tell him to curse God and die? Why hold on to your integrity? That means this man would reject the God that had been in his life in order to please his wife. I'm here to tell you that a lot of these colloquialisms, a lot of these proverbial statements are made by people in the world to bring the saints of God into bondage. So my question to you again is, who's running and who's ruling your house? Who's running? And, and I know you think you head of household because you pay the taxes, but who's really running the house? Who's really setting the tone and who's really bringing the order in your house? Listen, I'm here to tell you as a parent, a true father, 
I am a true father. As a father, sometimes you're going to have to go against your wife. As a father, sometimes you're going to have to piss off your children, not because you're doing something unrighteous or you're provoking, as the scripture says um, in Ephesians, don't fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, right? But bring them up in the nurture of the Lord. He, he He's not talking about, you know, making your kids angry just for angry sake, you know, or, or making your kid's life oppressive. But, but he's talking about that there has to be a rule. Our heavenly father is the first example of a father. And he told his children in the day that you eat of that tree, right? In the day you shall surely die. And these were children made after his image and likeness, birthed by his hands, birthed by his word and his commands. But when they sinned against him, God drew the line in the sand and put an angel with a flaming sword at the tree of life so that they would not in their rebellion go and do what they want to do just because it was in their own uh, a will to do it. In other words, you think you're dying now because you're separated from me? Touch that tree. Try to touch that tree. And that angel has orders. I've dispatched that angel with orders to destroy you if you try to touch that tree. And so Adam and Eve had to leave the garden and go and till the ground. My point is, too many of us have become apologetic. Too many of us have become sympathetic and empathetic to our kids. For example, if you are a single mother or a single father, you sit there and you, you be empathetic to that child because you're thinking, oh my God, that child didn't have a father in his life, so I got to do everything for... Listen, I'm here to tell you, our Heavenly Father said that He will not put more on you than you can handle or bear. And you must realize that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, every year, every season, every decade, every century, it doesn't matter. Every millennia, the devil is trying his best to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his goal. So we don't have time to spoil our children. In fact, the word of God says that a, a son that is spoiled will bring his parents to shame. That's what the word of God says. But we go, oh, no, I'm going to spoil my baby. OK, so disregard everything God said and keep doing it your way. The reason why salvation doesn't come to our household is because we don't know who's running it. We don't know who's ruling it. In fact, we, we you know, you have parents. My mother, my God, God rest her soul. My mother, look, it didn't matter if you was visiting from out of town. If you was visiting from South Carolina or Florida or California, whatever, and you happened to decide to drive in there Sunday morning, my mother would be like, okay, well, put your suitcase there and come with us to church. She wasn't leaving nobody at her house. She was, this was her house, Right? Help me, Holy Spirit. Oh, my God. I wish I had a witness. I wish I had a witness that was watching me right now that would say in all sincerity, not shucking and jiving, not trying to be cool with it and trying to act like you're a pastor. I'm the head of the household. No, but I would to God that there was somebody watching me right now that would say the honest truth that, listen, I am an eagle in my household, right? You, I nurture you to a certain point, but at a certain point in time, you need to be able to fly on your own. You need to be able to fly on your own. And if you can't fly on your own, I'm tearing up the, mat, the nest. I'm tearing up the nest because you can't stay here and I ain't going to stay here. I'm here to tell you that too many of us, the reason why salvation can't come to our household is because we are afraid of tough love. We are afraid of telling our children no, because ultimately we want our children to like us. That's not what God said. God says, train up a child in the way that they should go. They have to go. They eventually have to go. And eventually, by reason of the fact, if we as parents die, if we die, what are they going to do? 
if they've been dependent on us on every single thing, if they've been um, uh, nurturing with us and they're teenagers, they're in their 20 years old and they're in 30 year olds and 40 year old and they're still on the spiritual teat. They're still on the spiritual bottle, right? Because we have not trained them for meat. We have not trained them in the basic tenets of the scriptures to know that, listen, my son, listen, my daughter, you're going to have to give an account for every evil thing that you did. Look at the God we serve. We serve a holy God who says that every deed done and every idle word spoken will be brought into the judgment. So can my son uh, come and say, come on, God. Uh, uh, come on, God, you know, I love you, God. I love you, God. You think that's going to bring them into heaven? No, sir, no, ma'am. So one of the things we have to do is that we have to know who's running the house, who's ruling the house, who, who's, who's in charge, right? If your children are in charge of the house and if you leave the house, like, like you the visitor, you know, and then when you come, when you got your kids, uh, y'all, y'all forgive me. I'm going to go on a little rant for a second. When you got your kids slamming doors in your house, when you got your kids locking bedroom doors in your house and saying, when you knock on the door, you knock on the door and they go, who is it? <laughs> when you, when you like, mom, I'm on the phone, <laughs> you know, like, you know, they run up your phone bill or they got their cell phone on your account. And you ask them, who you talking to? And they're like, I'm talking to one of my friends. <laughs> oh, I know y'all get, I know some people get mad at me right now. Some people get mad. You tell the child, put the phone away. And the child gets pissed off, stomping their feet and poking their lips out. Look, before we can talk about salvation in my household, listen, I'm here to tell you that it's cute to use phrases, biblical phrases and stuff. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me in judgment, uh, 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 I shall condemn, right? It's easy to say that, but keep reading the verse. It says, this is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord. I'll never forget, you know, back in the day. Now, you know, I'm, I'm a little older than y'all, right? So back in the day, we didn't have cell phones, right? Uh, and they were out, but we couldn't afford them, right? And so what we had is that one, the phone in the kitchen and the phone in mama in the room, <laughs> right? And the phone in the kitchen, because mama used to be on the phone and, and she would be cooking, the phone in the kitchen had that long cord. Y'all remember that long spongy cord? Y'all remember, right? Come on, y'all Y'all not 16, Y'all not 16. Y'all remember that, that long springy cord. And mama used to have that long cord and she would have the phone on her head and she'd be cooking and talking, right? But then when you need to call your girlfriend or your boyfriend, right? When you need to call them, you go and stretch the phone around the, 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 the doorway. And you're on the floor in the living room or in the next room or you're sitting on the couch and you're on the floor. What would mama used to do? First thing she'd do, she'd start yelling at you. You better get off my phone, run off my phone, Bill. What do you, who do you think you are? Right? And what it did, it taught you that if you wanted those things, <clears throat> that you had to work for it. It taught you if you wanted those things, then you had to go get your own. Right? But mama used to say that as long as you're under my roof, it's my rule. I think mama was the mama and daddy was the first ones that coined the phrase is my way or the highway, which meant if you don't, if you choose not to do it my way, hit the bricks, go outside. Right. But some of y'all say, uh, some of y'all say, oh, my God, uh, I, I'm not going to let my kid go outside because they're going to get cold. Yeah. If they got cold a little bit, they'll learn how to pay a bill. Now, I know y'all think I'm going on a rant, but I'm here to tell you that before we can use the biblical truths of salvation coming to our household, we need to seriously answer the question, who's running my house? Who's ruling my house? Who's in control in my house? 
Who's setting the tone in my house? You're a child of the living God, but if I stood outside your door room um, or uh, outside your, your apartment or your house, right? The music and the sound that's coming from that house, I don't know it's a godly home. My mother ruled our house. My mother ruled. And, and Doreen, and you're right, but, but let me say this. Even if mama told you, let's say you got a little job and mama said you're going to give $50 a week or $20 a week or $25 a week back in the day or, you know, whatever the case may be. If mama asked for money and she said that this money is for the phone bill, guess what? Even if she was using your money to pay the phone bill, guess what? You still couldn't do what you want to do because why? The phone bill was attached to the phone and the phone was attached to the wall and the wall was attached to that room and the room was attached to that apartment or that house that was attached to mama's name or daddy's name right so so even though you paid a certain bill didn't mean you could do whatever you want as long as you was under their roof because everything was under their auspices everything was under their governance right and so um, so what, what's happening is that the, the, the real problem is when we talk about salvation coming to my household and into my children, the question you got to answer yourself, right? If you want salvation to come into your household, first thing you're going to have to do is that you're going to have to take back your house. My God, help me, Holy Spirit. You're going to have to take back your house, Right. You that that's and even if you got saved today, let's say yesterday you were living in sin and you were uh, being used of the enemy and you was letting just anything go on in your house. Right. Um, the first thing that God is going to do, the first thing that God is going to do in your life is that he's going to start giving you boldness that when you come in the house, you're going to be like Jesus. When Jesus walked into the temple, that was his house, the, the temple that belonged to his father. And he saw the people had now made the temple into a den of thieves. What did Jesus do? With the boldness of the Holy Ghost, he ripped up tables and, and, and flipped over this and flipped over that and threw money boxes on the floor and said, my house, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. And so the first thing that God is going to do is that God is going to give you and what you need to pray for is holy boldness because you need to take back your house. Because here's the point. If I allow my kids to do whatever they want and they're still under my authority because they're in my house, right? I don't care if you're 20 years old. I don't care if you're 25 years old. If you chose to live with me, you chose to live under my rules. I have four children. I have one grandbaby. And I told my children, y'all can always stay with me. But when you stay with me, you're staying with my rules, which means when I go to church, you go to church. When I go to prayer meeting, you go to prayer meeting. If I get up in the morning for the prayer line, you up too. Why? Because what I have come to believe, what I have come to understand that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, and no man can come unto the Father except he come by Jesus. So my son or my daughters, they they may want to go clubbing, but I know that clubbing is going to put your behind in hell. They may want to have same-sex relationships, but I know that same-sex relationship is going to put you in hell. They may want to um, shack around and do the things that they want to do, but I know that that's going to put you in hell. They may want to listen to worldly songs and, and, and just groove to the worldly music out there, but I want you to know that how we learn as human beings, we learn by repetition. We learn by what we hear, by what we see, by what's in our environment. And the more we put that in our mind, it becomes a part of a habit. It becomes a part of our uh, internal makeup. It becomes a part of our thought process. And because I know that, then what I'm telling you, my son and my daughter, no, you can't come here and bring that music. No, you can't come here and bring your friends in here and just be smoking in my house or drinking in my house or getting high in my house. No, 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 no. That's not happening. 
Because if I want salvation to come to my household, then I gotta, if I'm truly the head of my household, then as the head of my household, I recognize that as the head, I'm not only responsible, but I'm accountable for everything that goes under this roof. I can't blame my friends. I can't blame the children. I can't blame a mother-in-law, a father-in-law, a aunt, a uncle, a grandmother, a grandfather. I can't blame anyone. Listen. Let me show you something really powerful. When when I first got married, when I first got married, uh, mind you, I was I was Thomasina and Curtis son. Right. So my mother, I was her son. Um, my daddy, I was his son. Right. But when they came to my house. I was the head of my house. So my mother couldn't come to my house and do whatever she want and use the, the, the term that you're my son. So I could do whatever I want. Thank God my mother and my father were saved. So I didn't have to worry about them coming by my house doing anything unrighteous. But I'm talking about those of you who that's your mama, that's your grandmother, that's your father, that's your grandfather, that's your aunt, your uncle. Maybe it's the person that raised you. Maybe it's the person that saved you from a lot of mess. Maybe it's your best friend that helped pull you out of some messes. Maybe it was your best friend that spoke to your heart when you wanted to commit suicide and they convinced you, no, live, live, live. And you feel like you owe them something. But guess what? When you go under your roof, the roof that God has given you, then guess what? Guess what? God now holds you accountable for what goes on that roof. So if that friend walks in there and they come in there with their beer bottle, I'll give you a perfect example. On Saturday, on Saturday, we were feeding the community in the church. And one gentleman came into the church and he came into church and he had his beer. He came into church and had his beer, and um, I didn't see him walk in with the beer, but when I was walking around the church and just greeting everybody and talking with everybody and ministering and keeping my eyes open for the devil, because, you know, we got to do that, keep my eyes open for the devil, I, I saw this can in the windowsill, and I said, what is that? And I went to the can, and I looked, and I said, it's a beer. First thing I did, first thing I did, I turned around. Mind you, I was at the door greeting everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Welcome. Are you hungry? Come on. We want to feed you. We want to bless you today. Happy Thanksgiving. God bless you, my sister. God bless you, my brother. But when I saw that can, my God, help me, Holy Spirit, to articulate this right. When I saw that can uh, sitting in the windowsill in the house that God had called me to be pastor over, I turned around like Mufasa and I said, whose beer can is this? And a couple of people, when they saw my face, they pointed the guy out. They was like, that's his, that's his pastor, that's his. I walked up to him with respect and I said, hey, my brother, how are you? He says, I'm doing fine, Pastor. I said, listen, let me ask you a question. I said, did you put that beer can over there in the windowsill? He was like, yeah, Pastor, because when I leave here, I'm going to go outside and I'm going to drink. I'm not going to drink in here. I said, let me tell you something. I said, that beer is destroying your life. And I know that beer destroys your life. I know that beer is destructive for you. And I'm telling you right now, I said, that beer defiles your temple, your body, which belongs to the Holy Spirit. So I cannot allow you to bring that in here, knowing that you're going to take that outside and drink it all over. So I said, I'm going to let you know now, I'm giving you respect, but I'm going to let you know now, I'm pouring it out. I said, okay. And he said, well, Pastor, I, I was going to drink it the outside. I said, well, I'll, make you, I'll tell you this much. If I don't pour it out, you got to get out. Okay, see, some of y'all will be like, no, Pastor, no. That's not the Christian thing to do. No, you're supposed to love. You're supposed to just be kind and empathetic. I had one man that came to me on last Thursday. And, and, and I was talking to someone because someone was being obnoxious and they were dogging out Christians. And I told them, I said to the man, I said, I said, why are you talking about Christians like that? What, what's the problem? Right. And then this guy jumped in and he said, hey, pastor, come on now. You know, as a Christian, you're supposed to lay down. I said, what do you mean lay down? He says, you got to be humble, you know. If that's the way the guy feels, that's the way the guy feels. I said, so 
if someone is walking on me, you want me to lay down? He says, yeah. He said, you should lay down so I should walk on your back. And I said to him plainly, I said, brother, who hurt you? He said, what do you mean who hurt you? I said, who hurt you? He said, what do you mean? I said, for you to have that concept that you expect for a believer to just fall down, somebody hurt you. And guess what? He ended up confessing that his uncle, who was a Christian, hurt him. And ever since then, he's been looking for ways to dog out Christians, right? Some of y'all have no power because you've been allowing the devil to walk all over your back. You've been allowing the devil to play all in your household. You've been allowing the devil to do things and you've been uh, defending your actions by talking about, well, it's my children and I'm all they got. Who, who's running your household? Who's in control? Who's setting the pace in your home? Who's setting the rules in your home? If you want salvation to come to your household, I'm not telling, listen, not everybody has my personality. I told y'all 90% of the time, I'm a, I'm a quiet person, but I, I have a lion heart. And, and, and the Lord has blessed me with that. The Lord has blessed me with that, that I know how to be soft. I know how to be tender. Anybody who knows me, even my members that are on, some of the members that are on the church, on the conference line right now, they'll tell you, right? You ain't going to find nobody in my church that run around and plays with the kids and I'm all tender with them. I'm laughing with them. I'm joking with them. Leave, even on Sunday, the kids running up to me, hugging me and they're like, pastor, I want a paper airplane and I'm making paper airplanes for them and jets and we're flying them and we're playing around and, and they're showing me their little stuff. And I'm like, wow, that is so great. Oh my God, that is beautiful. What you got there? <gasps> Ooh, that is fantastic. That's me. But then when the enemy comes into the house, See, you're not going to have salvation come to you or your children if you allow the devil to do whatever he wants. If you allow the children to manipulate your children to believing an untruth, but because it's your child, you feel like I just have to support them. Are you mad? So that means if the world says, like right now, the world is starting to say that it's okay to smoke weed. It's okay to drink. It's okay to do all these things, right? W what happens? The Bible says, if you're friends with the world, you're enemies of God. So I want to share two things with you, right? I was reading this a few moments ago. And when I was looking at answering the question, first of all, let's look in Psalms chapter three, Psalms chapter three. And when you get there um, in Psalms chapter three, I want you to look at um, let, let's I'm going to read the whole chapter. You write, Danny. Passion for Christ is not always gentle. You write about that. Sometimes you have to be the Bible says the kingdom of God suffered violence but the violent takes by force. Sometimes you're not going to the walls of Jericho going, please fall down. Please fall down. I beg you to fall down. No, sometimes you got to yell at that thing. Sometimes you got to say, no, 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 no. Some, listen, I'm, I'm here to tell you, if some of y'all took a little bit of the crazy that's inside of you and show it to your family, your kids would act right. See, they think you soft. Uh, let, let me <laughs> let me go further, right? Psalms chapter three. Look what it says. It says, "Lord, how how they have increased who troubled me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the." one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. I laid down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. 
I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people, Selah. Now listen, here, here's what the psalmist said. This is when David, when he was running from Absalom, his son. Absalom uh, was trying to take over the kingdom and Absalom was, was coming after his own daddy. And, and David was running from Absalom. And, and the Lord used that circumstance to teach something about salvation. That salvation, power, um, all these things belong to God. In other words, um, salvation belongs to God, right? So, so in order for my child to be saved, in order for me to meet the Lord when he comes, right? I have to pray that the Lord will have mercy on me. The word of God says, today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart as it was with those in the wilderness, right? When they hardened their hearts and they fell, they were destroyed because they did not believe, right? And so um, salvation is a gift of God. It is not of works. It's not anything you do to earn salvation. Your child can't earn salvation. Guess what? You can't give your child salvation. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord says, that the way salvation comes to your house and why it comes to my house when I believe. This is why anyone who has come to my house, when you come to my house, there's a spirit of peace in my house. There's a spirit of rest in my house. Why? Because I'm serving the spirit of peace. I'm serving the spirit of rest. So that comes into my house. When my house get chaotic is because I've turned away from the spirit of peace. Right. So th I've had times in my house where someone came to my house and they were acting all unseemly. And I had to tell them, get out. Sorry, you can't do that here. Get out. No, you ain't watching that here. No, turn that off. I don't care. If they got a big screen TV. Turn that mess off. You ain't watching that in my house. Right. And, and you know what it does? Let me tell you what it does, because I know some of y'all. Let me, let me tell you this. Let me, let me whisper this. I'll make sure nobody is watching, right? I know the real issue is that you really don't want to be alone. That's the real issue. You don't want to be alone and you don't want people talking about you, right? But, but unfortunately, that's the life of the believer. The Bible says we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A peculiar, the word peculiar means strange. We're a strange people. We go against the current vernacular. We go against the current flow of the world. We don't accept everything. We don't um, go along to get along. We don't do that. So that means if you choose to follow Christ, the word of God says that you will be persecuted for Christ's sake. In other words, people will reject you. Jesus even says, do you think that I came to bring peace? He says, no, I came to bring a sword. That mother will be against mother-in-law. Son will be against father. Daughter will be against daughter-in-law. You know, families will be, will be divided. Why? Because one has decided to follow Jesus. And the other one says, it doesn't take all that. And so here's the problem. When you start to do things God's way and you start to take command of your home, guess what? They're not going to want to stay with you. They're not going to want to hang with you. They're not going to want to be with you. And you got to be okay with that. You can't let nobody put guilt on your shoulder and say, oh, you know, if you really love the Lord, your whole family would follow you. That is not of the Bible. It's not what God says. Because you can't get more holy than God and his kids rebelled against him. Even the word of God, when it talks about Jesus in John, the first chapter, it says he came unto his own 
and his own received him not. So, so when you, when you look at the truth of the word, this is why I encourage parents that when parents says, oh, pastor, pray for my child because he, he ran away from home. And I said, well, what was going on in the home? Well, pastor, I told him that he can't smoke in my house. He can't drink in my house and he need to be in the house at a certain time or my door is going to be locked. And he decided not to come home. I said, then sister, rejoice and be glad. Oh, my God, help me, Holy Spirit. Rejoice and be glad. Why? Because when here's what divides a home. What divides a home with, and, and this is righteous. And, and I, I dare any Christian to challenge me biblically on this statement. What divides a home is when we have two different lordships. This is why it's madness when, when a, a, a woman or a man goes out there and marries an unbeliever. That's madness. But you have believers that go to that person knowing their spouse is not saved, knowing their fiance is not saved, and they go, girl, I'm so happy for you. Oh, you seem so happy. I'm so, are y'all crazy? That person can't get a prayer through to save their life. You've been with that person for two years and not once have they mentioned the name of Jesus. Not once have he spoken a scripture to even encourage your soul in the Lord. But you get all happy and excited because he said, hey, 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 baby, listen, uh, um, did you buy that video game that I asked you to buy? And listen, when you go to church, tell the pastor to lift me up in prayer. And you come to church. Oh, pastor, he said, pray for me. Y'all don't know me in truth. Lord have mercy. Sometimes I want to choke somebody in front of Jesus. Because it's like, what kind of foolishness? God said, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Don't do it. That means before, right? Right? You're right about that, Danny. Yes, sir. You are so right about that. Listen, before you decide he's cute, she's cute, you better quantify their spirit. And let's be honest, if you ain't got no spirit, and I know that's bad English, right? But if you don't have no spirit, if you're not saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and walking with Jesus by yourself, then you need to bring the person that you are considering to the church, to people who are not caught up with their lips, their hips, and their thighs, and their pecs, and their, their biceps, and their tone of voice. You need to bring them to somebody who is not all caught up in the lovey-dovey so that they can read that person. Need to be able to read something because too many of you, you're rushing to get involved with something and then later on you want counseling. And later on, you plague in the church. Oh, y'all lift up my spouse in prayer. Oh, Lord, he driving me up the wall. Uh, what happened to that before you said I do? Don't you know that the enemy deceives until he gets you hooked? And so everything looks golden until you put it in your hand. That apple or fruit in the tree, the Bible says it looked good to Eve. And it probably tasted good too when she first bit into it. But I know that there's times, I'll never forget a friend of mine took me, many of y'all don't know this, um, I don't eat Chinese food. You know, look, nothing against the Chinese, but I don't eat Chinese food. Um, because of the Chinese food in this country um, is a hot mess. I don't eat it. And, um, you know, but before, years ago, I used to eat it. And, um, you know, but I don't eat Chinese food. 
And I'll never forget one time I was witness to this guy and this guy actually gave his heart to the Lord. And he was like, you know, pastor, you know, I really thank you for all you've done. And I'm going to take you out to lunch. And I was like, cool, you know. And we went out to lunch and he took me to some Chinese buffet. Right. And I'm sitting there going, Jesus, be offense. So I decided, let me get the stuff that, you know, doesn't look too dangerous. <laughs> right. So, so I started getting vegetables and I started getting some rice. Right. I took it back to my table and I ate, didn't stuff my stomach or nothing like that, but I ate and I was in my mind thinking, okay, I can't wait to get out of here. Right. But anyway, when we had finished, I left there and I got in my car and y'all, when I got in my car, you know, TMI, I'm giving you a little information. I got in my car. Y'all, I was speeding. Yes. Pastor was breaking the law. I was speeding. I was in a, a 40 mile an hour zone and I was going about 80. I was, yes, here's my confession, a video confession. I was speeding like crazy because y'all, it was like I ate Drano stuff. I, I felt it at the door. It was at the door saying, try to hold me in if you think you're going to hold me in. And, and I was speeding and every time I wasn't saved on that day, I'm going to tell you, I was not saved because when, when a car in front of me was, was slowing on that brakes, I don't care. It was an old lady. It was like, move out the way. I was screaming and I was like, Oh, I was like twitching in my seat and, and trying to cross my legs, right? While I'm trying to drive and I'm going like a bat out of hell. Right. I got home and when I got home, <laughs> I got to the front door and dropped my keys. Boy, I, I dropped my keys. I'm going to be honest with y'all. I almost started cussing because <laughs> I dropped my keys and I picked those keys up and I'm shaking. I'm sweating. Uh, I'm perspirating. Right. I ran upstairs and listen, I ran upstairs. And when I ran upstairs, man, I didn't even close my apartment door. I didn't even close my door. I left my door open, right? Jacket thrown on the steps. And I sat on that toilet and it was like Hiroshima. It was like, oh my God. I sat there and I don't know if y'all could really <laughs> understand. I sat there and Lord have mercy. My body was telling me I should have killed you. Going there, you know better than going there eating that mess, right? Oh, I made it. Danny, I made it. But if it was two more minutes, I wouldn't have made it. And, and Lord have mercy. When I finished on that toilet, I had to bend about 15 pounds lighter. Because my body said, I'm going to get rid of everything. <laughs> Not just what you ate. I'm a, I'm gonna give you a natural enema. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean you out. And I don't know if y'all ever, and I know this is TMI, but I don't know if y'all ever experienced being cleaned out so much until you felt weak. <laughs> you felt like an old man. You felt like an old person, just weak and, and trembling and, and stuff like that. And y'all listen. I couldn't do nothing. Listen, my door is still open. Coat still on the floor, right? Uh, uh, pants around my ankles, right? I'm sitting there. And when finally I realized that it was all done, right? All I could do was like a victim. I was in the shower. <laughs> I was in the shower. Like, just like, Lord, forgive me. Because <laughs> I knew. I knew better. I listen, my body is a is a well-oiled machine. <laughs> if I eat anything that is not righteous, I don't care whose food it is. You could be mother so and so from the church. If your food ain't right, my body's going to tell me you ain't right. So a lot of time I crack people up cuz they'll say, "Well, pastor, you know, let me know what you think about it." And I said, "I'll let you know when it comes out." 
Because that's the only way I can tell you if it's really good. Right? Because, you know, sometimes things taste good going in, but it's horrible coming out. And this is indicative of the same thing that a lot of you get involved with relationships that in the moment taste good. They feel good. They look good. They sound good. But deep down inside, they're nasty. Deep down inside, it's disgusting. It's going to make you sick. Deep down inside, it's going to affect you. And so I went back to that brother and I told him, brother, I am so glad that you are saved. I'm so glad that you realize that we are brothers in Christ. So as your brother, I will tell you that if you ever ask me to go out with you, don't ever take me to that place again, ever, or any place like that. Do you understand me? He said, pastor, I got you, right? Now I'm saying all this to say this. When you talk about salvation coming to your household, the question is, who's running your house? Who's ruling your house? Now, if you're in someone else's house, then you really can't impress that house until you impress the one who is ruling the house. When you look at the word of God, when it talks about, I'm just, I just heard the Holy Spirit say something and, and I was thinking about what he said. Remember the scripture where it says, behold, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of them that brings good news, right? He didn't say, behold, how beautiful are the mountains. He says, of the feet of them. That brings good news. So in other words, where you stand, you bring beauty. But in order to affect that whole area, you got to find out who's ruling. Now, if it's your house, you got to clearly and precisely answer this question. Who's ruling my house? For some of us, it may not even be people who live with you. Because you've had this, maybe you've always been the black sheep of the family. Maybe you always had problems in your life. And so because of that, you're trying to impress. And so even though they don't live in your house, they're actually ruling your house. And that's something you have to think about. Because if they're ruling your house, even from the outside, you got to take back possession of your home. If your kids are ruling the house and all their lives, you've allowed them to just do whatever they want. And all you do is yell and scream. But eventually you go in your room and you let them have their way. You got to take back your home. And then once you take back your home, what you do is that the same rules. This is how salvation comes to your household. The same rules that God applies to you. You tell everybody under your authority. These are the same rules for you. Now, because you do that, then guess what? This is where the word of God talks about that if a person is already married, not that you got saved and married an unsaved person, but let's say you're already married and you got saved, but your husband or your wife didn't get saved yet. The word of God says, then that other person is sanctified by you. Why? Because you bring holiness into your household. You bring righteousness into your household. You bring the light of Jesus into your household. And so you bring the wisdom of God into your household. So your household, almost like if you remember Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom was a man who when David got the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the Philistines and then the Ark, when they brought it, they wasn't carrying it the right way and the Ark looked like it was going to tilt and one of the guys went to grab the Ark and God killed him. And so David was afraid to touch the Ark and bring it home. So what they did is made the Ark go to Obed-Edom's house. And when Obed-Edom, when the Ark was there, because the Ark was at his house, his house began to be blessed. So in other words, when the 
spirit of the Lord is in you and you're in your mother's house or your father's house, guess what? Blessings have come to that house. Wisdom has come to that house because of the way you stand. But your prayers should be towards the head of that household because if you can get him or her to believe the God in you, then guess what? You can have rulage over the house that you don't even own. And that's one of the things I thank God for. Because it seems that practically everywhere I've gone, people give me authority. Not because I'm anything. No, I'm nothing. But because they, they discern and recognize the God that is within me. And so I'll have business people, I have business owners or old people, white people, black people, women, men, um, Filipino people, Hispanic people that will come to me for advice. Why? Not because I'm the smartest thing ever. No, because everybody's ignorant of something. And honestly, there's a lot of things I don't know. But they'll come to me because they, they've learned to recognize that I'm not talking off the top of the dome. And I'm not sitting here talking because I want to have my way or I want to manipulate you into something. No, but they start to discern that this guy is speaking to us from the presence of God, from the spirit of the Lord. And, and he's showing us things that we didn't know or we didn't understand. He's given us light that we didn't have before. So it starts to build confidence in people concerning me, right? But, but at the same token, I recognize it's not because of who I am, but it's because of who God is and what God has called me to be and what he's doing in my life, right? So the same thing with you. You'll gain favor on your job. When you allow for the spirit of the Lord to live in you and set the tone for your life. And when the spirit of the Lord set the tone for your life, yeah, you may want to go on vacation. But if the spirit of the Lord says, no, stay home and pray, then you stay home and pray. And you're not fussing and getting upset. Oh, I just need to go on vacation. And the Lord said, I can't go. No, you're not having a temper tantrum. You're saying if God says don't go, then no is no. And I'm good with that. And so when you, you know, like today, you know, I was on my way home and there was a lot of traffic. And, and yesterday, as you guys know, I traveled all the way down with uh, two from my ministry team. I, I traveled all the way down to Maryland. So we drove like three and a half hours going and dream, three and a half hours coming back. Right. So I just finished driving, you know, six hours, almost seven hours going and coming Um uh, to 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 Maryland to go and support my spiritual daughter who was getting baptized, right? And so when I came home, I didn't get home until almost two o'clock in the morning and I was tired, right? And so I wanted to go home tonight, but when I saw that traffic, I didn't feel like being in traffic. And so right away I said, Lord, I said, what should I do? Because I really don't feel like going, being in traffic. The Lord said, why don't you go and sit down and start doing some of the teaching? So that's what I did. And guess what? I'm glad I did. I'm not sitting here mad that I'm not home. I'm not sitting here frustrated that I'm not home. No, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Why? Because God is not only my father, but he's my Lord. That's what Malachi says. He says, if I be your father, where is my honor? And if I be your Lord, where is my fear or my reverence? Right? So when we look at the home, if I want salvation to come into my home, if I want my home to be different, then I got to make sure that God is the Lord of my house. That means he won't be the Lord of my house if he's not the Lord of me. Right? Because I'll sugarcoat. I'll let things go because that may be my favorite child or this one may be my favorite aunt or this one may be the friend that have helped me through so much stuff. So I'll start to soften the ways that I am. But if you want salvation to come to your household and if you want salvation to come to your children, right, that's living in your household. Now, let me let me give a sidebar for a second. The kids that are outside of your home is a different thing. The kids that are outside of your home, they are in the mindset of independence, total independence. If they're living on their own, taking care of themselves, they're in the mindset of total independence. So what you have to do is that the way you deal with them is that you have to pray that the Lord breaks their pride. I'm, I'm trying to help y'all tonight. 
break their pride because their pride says, I don't need anybody because I'm the ruler of my own life. See, when you start to realize the truth that apart from God, I am nothing because in him I live, I move and I have my being. Then guess what? Even though I independently live alone and even though independently I can make my own choices and I can choose to go home, I can choose to travel, I can choose to do whatever I want to do. Right. But guess what? My choice is to follow the spirit of the Lord. Right. Because my independence has submitted itself to dependence on God. And so children that are outside of the home that are proud for their abilities and what they have and their own time and their own schedule, you have to pray that God would break their pride. And the way God breaks pride is through fall. Now, this is key. Listen, this is very key. I want you to listen. Take this. I'm telling you, take this, right? When your kids fall, you cannot right away pick them up. I'll say it again. When the kids outside of your home fall, you can't right away pick them up. Because if you, if you go into your bank account and if you go into your resources to save them right away, then all they do you cleaned up their mess and they run right back to their independence. You have to allow them space to figure out. Because what the Holy Spirit will do, the Holy Spirit will speak to their minds and say, remember what your mother told you? Remember what your daddy told you? Remember what your grandmother told you? And when they call you, tell them, say, baby, Listen, I know right now you're going through a lot, but listen, pray and ask God, ask God what you should do. Then you said, well, pastor, they ain't saved. No, tell them. They know it because the seed is in them. Tell them, ask God what you should do. And what will happen is that in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that chaos that's going on in their lives, they'll start to know God will show them you cannot make it on your own. You need me. God will even show them through their anger when they get mad at you that you didn't pay that bill for them. God will tell them, when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will pick me up. And they'll go to God and say, God, I need help. Show me what to do. And it'll start to lead them to a knowledge of Christ. But if every time they fall, yes, Danny, it's called enabling. Every time they fall, if you just pick them up right away, save them right away. They don't have money for groceries. You buy groceries. They, they lost their cell phone. You buy another phone. Guess what? They still, if the prodigal son, after he wasted all of his money, if he could just get on the phone and say, hey, dad, why me some more money? And his dad do it. Guess what? He would have stayed out there with those unrighteous women. And this is why our kids stay out there. They stay out there because we have merely enabled them. We've told them, you my baby, and I ain't going to let my baby go hungry. They go out there and have children, child after child after child after child, and they can't take care of the first child. But you, you doing free babysitting services. Guess what? You're enabling them to keep on going out there and doing that mess. If you teach them the hardness of life before they go out, then when they go out and they hit the hardness, they'll know how to deal with it. But if you never taught them and then they left you because they thought I'm big and bad, I got a job and I can do on my own, then guess what? They go out there. Yes, Wanda, we become their puppets to manipulate through some tears and some crying and some falling apart. And guess what? They end up ruling your household, even though they don't even live there. So let me summarize. If you want salvation to come to your household, number one, you have to ask the Lord, Lord, show me who's in control of my house. If it's me, then I'm responsible and accountable for what goes on in this house. That means take possession of your house. 
That means everything that's in your house belongs to you. It don't matter if it's their bed, their dresser, their door, their TV, everything belongs to you because the TV wouldn't work without my electricity. The TV wouldn't work without my cable. Your computer wouldn't work without my Wi-Fi. And understand this, the devil don't care. You keep being apologetic to your kids. The devil don't care. He'll come through any medium your kid has just to feed their soul with madness. And because we're too afraid to stand up to our children and, and take possession of what God has given us in our household, children are gifts from the Lord. They belong to God. Don't allow that devil to tell them that it's okay to dress certain ways. It's okay to act certain ways. It's okay to behave in certain ways. No, no, no. You need to teach them the way and not be ashamed and not be afraid. And guess what? If you make it so tough for them and if they still want to rebel, they're going to leave. And you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with the fact that if they leave because they don't want to follow the right way, that is their choice because salvation comes from the Lord. Acts 4 and 12 says, and neither is there salvation in any other whereby men must be saved. You, you can only be saved. Jesus said these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He did not say I am a way. A truth, a life, which means one of many. No, he says, I'm the way, exclusively, the only way. So when I know this, that means I'm not going to tell my children there's 15 different roads that they could take. No, baby girl, baby boy, there's only one way you could take. And if you, if you accept that, then the Lord will save you. But if you don't accept that, then you will eventually be lost for eternity. That's the truth. And the world will tell you, oh, you hate your children. The world will tell you, oh, you're not being fair. The world will tell you, you're not being supportive. But guess what? I would rather my children hate me in this life and make it to heaven than for them to love me and say kumbaya and break hell wide open. Are y'all following me? Too often we're trying to be our kid's best buddy. And so salvation can't come to our household because salvation hasn't firstly come to us that we have made up our minds to know and to fully be persuaded in our hearts and minds that Christ is the only way that if I need life, if I want life, if I desire life, life is in Christ. And when I know that life is in Christ, then my son and my daughter, even though I love you, even though I, I, I wish that you could have, my God, my four kids, I wish that they could have still been in that time when you just hold them in their arms and all you had to do with them is spitting up a little milk and making a little mess on their diaper and you could smell their toes and, 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 and push your face in their face and, and, and rub your face in their belly and they start laughing. I would to, would to God they could remain just like that forever. But, but that would really be a problem. You know, but they grow up. They grow up with their own minds, their own choices, their own friends, their own buddies, their own loves, their own interests. And it's up to us, it's up to us as parents to lead them in the right way, which means that if, if I'm following the right way and my kids are rejecting me because I'm following the right way, then guess what? They're rejecting the Christ that is to give them life. So guess what? I recognize your life is not going to be full and complete. And there's no way you and I can walk together. Why? Because we don't agree. And you have to be okay with that. But keep your heart open. Keep your soul open. Keep praying for them. That's what Job did. Job prayed for his children daily. Because he said, perhaps they may have sinned and cursed God. Pray for them daily. But don't compromise. Don't lower the standards 
just so that you might get their applause. Don't do that. Because you may have a portfolio, that a, fin a, a family portfolio that looks good to everybody. But the truth of the matter is, who's ruling your house? Who's running your house? Who's the leader of your house? Salvation can come to your household, but number one, you have to answer this question, who's ruling your house? If it's you, you got to take control of your house. If it's not you, you still must take control of your house. And then once you take control of your house, now you must make sure that everybody in that house is following the same rules that you have to follow. Okay? And then what that's going to do is either going to make them closer to you because they're going to learn Jesus Christ or either it's going to repel them from you. And you got to be okay with that. Keep praying for them, but make sure first that it's in you first. If the God of peace is within you, then you're going to have peace in your home. If the God of peace is not within you, then you're going to have a God of chaos in your home. If you just let anything go on in your home, then guess what? It's going to be chaotic. It's going to be confused. Because you got good, bad, and evil going on in your home. So you got to make up your mind. It's not just about saying the words. Faith without works is dead. And that's what these teaching series is trying to teach you. I'm trying to share with you that it's about some things that we have to do, some serious things that we have to do to turn around our situations. And we can turn it around, but you got to be serious. Otherwise, you'll be one of those Christians that this year you're complaining about something. And in five years from now, you complain about the same thing. Why? Because you've never done anything to change what you're doing. You are the def definition of a lunatic doing the same thing, the same ways, and expecting different results, right? You, If you're sitting there and you're doing the same thing, you're using the same methods, you're allowing the kids to rule the house, you're allowing them to take over, and then you're constantly asking, Pastor, how can I get my kids saved? You can't get them saved. Your kids got to desire salvation from the Lord. They got to come to the knowledge that they are lost apart from him, which means you got to let them see the truth. You can't pacify. Look, I don't even like pacifiers for little babies. I really don't. You know, we have kids in our church that come and they got pacifiers. I go, oh, what's that in your mouth? Let me see. Let me see. What is that? What is that right there in your mouth? And they pull it out and they look at it. I said, what is that? And and sometimes they go, that's chuck a chuck Or that's kush kush. Or that's pacify, pacify, or pacifier. <laughs> and I go, yeah, you don't need that. I say, you don't need that. You don't need that. And for some of the kids, they'll drop it down until they get near their mommy, then they'll, <laughs> and for other kids, they look me in the face and just put it in their mouth anyway, right? But it's okay. I'm here to tell you that if you want to take control of your house, you got to make sure that you are the head of the household. And if you're not the head of the household, pray for the one and make sure you're living a life that is exemplary in the eyes of that person that is the head of the household and they will bring honor to you. They will honor you, they will bless you, and they'll start to follow you. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did to, to Daniel. They'll start to follow you. They'll start to look at you as, as a, a person that the gods are with you. That's what they did for Joseph. The gods are with him. But if you are compromising, who's with you? Amen. And so if you want salvation in your household, take control of your house. Doesn't mean that you come in there and you be super religious and super spiritual. No, you can laugh. You can roll in the carpet with the kids. You can play and you don't have to say, praise you, Jesus. No, you don't have to do that. You know, you can laugh. But also, you need to recognize what things honor my father and what things do not. And if certain things don't honor my father, then guess what? He can't be here. So, 
when 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 I see my kids' friends, you know, you don't come in my car cursing in my car. No, because I don't. So why would you come in my car cursing? Curb your tongue. My my oldest sister. Used to, I don't know if she still does it now, but she used to smoke cigarettes. And we we all everybody in my family loved fishing. And we used to go we used to go fishing. And um, one time I went to pick them up, and she come in my car with her cigarettes, and she rolling down my window about to lie. I said, I said, oh no 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 no. I said, you ain't smoking in my car, right? And <laughs> and she was like, she was like. Oh, come on, man. I'm going to blow it out the way. I said, no, you ain't smoking in my car. And I think that was the last time my sister ever been in my car. Right? I remember when I first got married. Barely knew any Spanish. And um, my my ex-wife, uh, um, grandmother, came to my house. And she barely knew any English. And she said to the guy, me and this guy uh, picked her up to bring her to my house to have dinner, Thanksgiving dinner. And she told him in Spanish, give me my cigarettes for the car, from the car, right? And I saw him go in the car and I saw the cigarettes. And I said, whoa. I said, Adwella, no fuma in my casa. No fuma. And she goes, she goes, my kiss, call me the queen. I said, yeah, but here I'm the king and there's no smoking in my house. And she looked at me and she says, I <laughs> like Celia Cruz. She's like, I <laughs> and she she came in our house and uh, they, you know, uh, my, my ex-wife was was Spanish. Uh, she was Puerto Rican and <laughs> she they were sitting in the kitchen and you know all the guys usually um and castro you might know this you you probably seen this uh when when spanish hispanic families get together the women usually congregate in one room and the men are using another room by themselves right uh for the most part um and uh so they were in the kitchen and i was in the living room with the men and you know i heard them talking talking and looking in my direction <laughs> right so so <laughs> they walked <coughs> they walked to the door and was going outside and I said hey babe where, where y'all going and she says uh, we're going outside for a little while I said what's the matter and she said she said grandma said the king can't she can't the king said she can't smoke in her in his house right and I think that was the last time she came over and one last story I'll tell you my ex-mother-in-law was taking care of my twins. And my twins, when they were born, at first they had some respiratory issues. And um, and so she would come to my house to take care of the kids. And she was a smoker. And I spoke to her and I said, listen, I need you to agree that you can't smoke while you're here taking care of these kids. And she agreed to it. And one day I came home and I saw cigarettes in the laundry room. Now, I know my wife doesn't smoke, and I don't smoke. And the kids didn't buy no cigarettes. So I asked her, I said, you brought these cigarettes to my house? I said, I'm going to tell you one more time. You got to stop smoking. Not here. Not around these kids. And one time I came home again, and I saw another butt. And I told her, I said, we don't need your services anymore. Now, mind you, that's some tough stuff. Because this is your mother-in-law. But I said, I'm sorry, I have a responsibility and I'm accountable to protect my family. And so a lot of people felt uncomfortable with me. But yeah, if you're going to follow Satan, you will be uncomfortable with me. If you're going to follow the ways of the world, you will be uncomfortable with me. But it's, my, it's not my job to pacify So, so I'm here to tell you, who's ruling your house? Who's ruling your house? Because if you have anybody ruling your house, you're not going to have salvation in the house. 
But if you, if God is the Lord of your life, then bring his lordship into your entire home. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you ahead of time what's going to happen. Either they're going to submit to your authority or they're going to hate you for it. And Jesus says, you shall be hated of all men for my sake. That's what Jesus said. You're going to be hated of everybody. So if you're looking to be buddy, buddy, then this, this teaching is not for you. If you're looking to go along to get along, then this teaching is not for you. But if you're looking to hear God say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, then you got to tell them the truth. And the truth is, this is God's house. So, God bless you. I'm going to conclude this video. And I'm going to come back again tonight because we're going to answer, we're going to make this a third time charm. And so we talked about how to overcome worry. We talked about if you're exhausted and overweighed, you know, um, overburdened, right? <laughs> I hear you, Castro. If you... <laughs> If we talked about um, how to deal with being overwhelmed. And now we're talking about um, salvation in your household. Um, and particularly salvation towards your kids and even yourself. Um, so those are the three teaching. Uh, let me see. The next one we're going to talk about. Yeah, we're going to talk about marriage the question was asked that uh, someone was never married and they're a little bit frustrated about that and there's this mental thought i wonder if this is going to be my lot the rest of my life that i'm going to be like this the rest of my life and that maybe you're not happy with it maybe you're not happy with your current situation maybe you're not happy being unmarried and you've been unmarried for so long You've been disappointed on so many different ways. Uh, we're going to talk about that. I just need to uh, refresh myself with something to drink. I need to pray a little bit. And then uh, I'm going to come back. And so stay tuned um, if you're able to. God bless you. I love you all with the love of Jesus. Let me hang up and I'm going to dial back in probably momentarily. All right? God bless.